Welcome to our service here at St. John's. Let us worship God. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We are called to be salt of the earth. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. We are called to abide in God. Jesus said, I am the way. We are a pilgrim people. So come, let us worship God. Let us sing praise to our God. So let's sing to God's praise the hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. be with you and also with you imagine for a moment that you're traveling on your own and you come to this small hilltop village in Burgundy France you've come here for a reason for thousands of young people from all around the world gather there every year to join in the worship of the Taizé community as you come to the church, to enter the church, you need to bend down, take off your shoes. Remembering Moses at the burning bush, take off your sandals, Moses, for you are standing on holy ground. 
already we're preparing to enter the church. And inside it's dimly lit. And already there are people gathered singing a simple, beautiful song in four-part harmony. You don't know anybody, but already you are part of the prayer. So you listen, listen for the melody, and then join in the singing. The original Greek word for church is ecclesia. It means assembly or gathering. And as we enter into the church, we are gathered up into that assembly, physically joining with those who are already there and spiritually joining with believers throughout the world, seen and unseen. COVID-19 has robbed us of this physical gathering. And there's grief, there's loss in that. But separated though we are, we are still the body of Christ, bound together in the reconciling love of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, in Jesus you came among us, calling us into the fullness of your life, calling us to be a light to the nation, a visible sign of harmony, justice and peace. In Jesus you laid down for us a firm foundation on which to build your church. Come to us afresh today and breathe your spirit of life into us that we may indeed live as a sign of your vision for this world. For we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now be still before the Lord. Rest quietly in his presence and listen. Let us bring before the Lord the words that may have hurt and all those words left unsaid, the anger we have felt and resentment we have fed. Let us be still before the Lord, rest quietly in his presence and listen. The Lord is slow to anger, willing to forgive, full of grace. Draw near to him, rest quietly in God's presence and listen. God calls us to be a holy people, expressing the harmony and justice of God a people of reconciling love. Hear then Christ's word of grace to us. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. One of the great gifts that we are given in life is light. In the daytime, the sun gives us light and warmth. And at night, the moon shines, not as bright as the sun, so if you're going somewhere you know will be dark, you will need to bring a light. If you're going camping where there aren't any electric lights, you will need to switch this on. You're going to need a torch to see by when the sun goes down. Sometimes we might need a torch to see things where the light cannot reach, like underneath a table or a shelf. Sometimes the power can go out in our house because of a storm and so torches or candles can be really helpful. Jesus once told a story about light. He said, you don't put a candle under a bowl.
because it could go out just like this. Instead, we put a candle on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. Then Jesus said something amazing. He said that we have God's light inside us. That doesn't mean that we have a torch inside us. What it does mean is that God has given us hearts to love, hearts to show kindness, hearts that long for justice. And God wants us to use our words and actions for good in our world. When we are kind and just, it's like we shine with the light of Christ. Once someone said things that made me feel very small and sad, and I felt worthless. It was as if someone had blown out my light. Just like that. Everything was dark inside. But then I met a friend who enjoyed being with me. And as we talked, that light inside began to glow again. It was as if his interest and thoughtful care lit the flame of God's light in me once again and restored me. God wants us to shine, not to hide our talents and gifts. God wants us to be generous with our lives, to be just and kind. And when we act like that, we help others shine as well. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The epistle reading this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, reading verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once 
you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. First Peter gives us so many metaphors and we learnt three or four of them last Sunday. I'm interested in the one called a chosen people which leads into his claim that we are also a royal priesthood and a holy nation. But just before he talks about Christians as a chosen people we were reminded in Neil Ritchie's contribution last Sunday that Peter uses the metaphor of the construction industry. Neil talked about the set point where people who are involved in building, like ships in Glasgow, had to have a sure and steady point from which to start the construction of something giant, like a cruise ship. So we're back with Peter, and he's the disciple that Jesus stated was the rock. So we're thinking about construction, even in leading into the idea of being a chosen people. These are the cornerstones on which you build the idea of chosen people. It's all about solid building from the start. And this is very much the start, about 64 AD, just three decades after Jesus' death and resurrection at about the age of 33. And Peter was probably writing this letter from Rome, where he was laying the foundations, the metaphorical bedrock, we can say, of the universal church. 
There's another metaphor that's relevant to us being the chosen people too. If you have a look at verses 1 and 2 in the same chapter we're talking about today, Peter begins by urging his readers to prune those things in their lives that prevent the growth in holiness. He says, Rid yourselves of malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So we learn from that metaphor that growing up as the chosen people into adulthood needs the right sustenance. Similarly, mature Christianity needs spiritual milk. So Peter wants the church to be a vibrant, life-giving community. When we think about metaphors, both last week and this week, we're aware that they're wonderful ways that they shape our identities. And as Reverend Peter has reminded us throughout the last few weeks, there are many well-known images of the church. We're a flock of sheep with a shepherd, we're diverse parts of the body of Christ, we are labourers in his vineyard and so on. How does a metaphor shape identity, especially the metaphor of us being chosen people? The power of metaphors lies in the fact that they never fully fit reality. They are never the exact literal meaning. They suggest, provoke and create new understandings of some important human experiences. My favourite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, uses a powerful metaphor to make a point about the way language is always used inexactly in messy daily life. Wittgenstein was born in Austria, worked for a time in Norway, was very familiar with the European winter. So the metaphor I'm going to read out to you is based on ice. Not ice in a glass, but ice on a skating rink or a frozen river. Wittgenstein writes, We have got onto slippery ice where there is no friction. And so, in a certain sense, the conditions are ideal. But also, just because of that, we are unable to walk. We want to walk, so we need friction. Back to the rough ground. Interesting metaphor. We like ice, we speed along. Um, but you can get on thin ice and you can fall out and fall over and fall in. Wittgenstein says, life is messy. We don't need too much ice. We need rough ground. We need some friction so we can walk carefully. Peter writes to the early church from and upon and towards the rough ground where life is messy and language needs to be attuned to shaping identities. We do not need the super smoothness of ice. We will fall over and make no progress. So we use as metaphors of grouping Christians into very distinctive identities a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. These metaphors are unifying groups and they carve out Christian identity distinctly from the values and culture of his age and our age. They distinguish between the immature life, when we need milk, from the mature life. He says in verse 10, Once you are not a people, but now you are the people of God. So we thrive on spiritual milk. Previously we were malnourished, driven by malice, envy, deceit and so on. Now we can be richly nourished through the Spirit and God's grace. Just as we have been mere cast-off building stones, piles of rubble, we can become the living cornerstones of faith. So Peter is urging the early church and us, 2,000 years later, to firm up our identities into what is distinctively Christian. He's not urging us to become a princely elite or a priesthood in any literal sense, a group of born to rule insiders. Rather, he's calling us to a vocational faith amidst the rough ground of messy life. His metaphors set out a sense of who we are as a group, not as a series of individuals located in various parts of Europe or Asia or some other continent. Wherever we are, the church as a group is set aside by a distinct identity which has bold moral features. These are summarised in Matthew. 
where we are urged to love God and love our neighbour as ourselves, drawing upon the earlier Ten Commandments, as the Reverend Peter set out so well in his address to us on October the 4th. Today, someone like Peter would be urging young Christians to construct a website or make a Facebook page or start up a Twitter account. These would be misunderstood by many only as a communication strategy, how to connect with each other. But the deeper message Peter could urge us would be develop and own a Christian identity in the world. The location is not as important as how distinctive those Christian values are. In the messy rough ground of social media, we need to carve out our sense of who we are. In actually doing this, in carving it out, we learn who we are, we make progress, we want to walk. As Wittgenstein warns us, we don't want to slip over on the smooth ice, because if we do, we stay put. How to make progress is what 1 Peter, 2nd chapter, verses 9 to 10, is telling the early church and telling us 2,000 years along on the pilgrim's progress. As someone wise has said, we make the path by walking it.
The next reading of the Bible comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and I'll be reading in the Samoan language. Oto, ole masima, ole lalulangi, oto. Ay afai e maangalu le masima, pesia simea e faamai ai. Ele ai simea e tsoi aunga ai. Na ona la foina e fafu, ma solia e tsangata. O oto, ole maala malama, ole lalulangi, oto. Ele ma fai ona lido, le a ai, ua tu ilunga, ole manga. La tau te le tutu ina foi, le mo li, I le tu uai i lalo o le mea e fuai saito. A e tu ui lunga lava o le tu ngā moli i a popola atu ai i e o i le whale uma. I a whaapea o nga popola atu lō o tau mā lama lama i luma o tangata. I nga ia lā tau i loa, lā o tau a meo lelei, lā tau te vivi i atu ai i lō o tau te mā oi i le langi. Christ calls his followers the salt of the earth and the light of the world. For some of us, images of salt and light may not be particularly evocative. These items are so commonplace that every Australian kitchen probably has them. In fact, salt and light are so plentiful in our lives that we must be cautious with their use. Our health demands that we cut down on the salt in our food, and for the planet's health, we must remember to flick the lights off when we leave the room. 2,000 years ago, the elements of salt and light were much more precious and life-sustaining. Salt was used as a standard payment for labor, the root of our word salary. It kept food from spoiling, was used to treat wounds, and was an element of Hebrew sacrifice. It was even included in the blessing of newborn babies. Light was also important and was obtained from oil squeezed in the olive presses of the Mediterranean. When ignited, it provided a guiding light in the darkness and a flame to brighten the house. Like salt, light featured in Hebrew worship and provided a symbolic reminder of that first voice in creation. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. The language of these times is still with us when we remark that a colleague is worth his salt, or when we say that a friend lights up the room. The healing and preserving power of salt continues to resonate. The metaphor of light as an illuminator of beauty and truth still penetrates our culture. As Christians, we are challenged to reclaim these domestic metaphors as an identity and to hear Christ's words of mission anew. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. As salt and light, Christ's disciples are named and commissioned as part of a new creation as God reconciles and redeems the old. As part of this new creation, we are reminded that what starts in the church on a Sunday rightly flows into other parts of our world all week long. Salt starts in the shaker and light begins in the lamp, but both substances to be any, of any value must be poured out and used. Christians are called to live lives seasoned with faith, hope, and love, lives illuminated by the truth as the church advocates for justice and peace. Just as salt must retain its saltiness and a lamp must be put on a stand, Christians of any value are called to be worth their salt and to light up the lives of others, forgiving, serving, and loving in radical ways. This is not an invitation, but an identification. Just as Peter is told, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Christ's followers are told, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And on you, God will build his kingdom. Let us pray. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Giving God, you blessed us with saltiness, but we became bland. You trusted us with your word, but we did not keep it. You lit a flame in our midst, but we hid it under formality, smothered it with our fears. God, in your mercy, forgive us. Forgiving God, we believe that you have called us to be salt and light, that you offer us time and space and strength to begin again. Giving and forgiving God, we thank you. 
Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Amen. Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 in Korean. 우리가 다시 자친하기를 시작하겠느냐? 우리가 어찌 어떤 사람처럼 친구들을 너희에게 붙이거나 혹 너희에게 맡거나 할 필요가 있느냐? 너희가 우리의 편지라 우리 마음에 썼고 묻 사람이 알고 있는 바라. 너희는 우리로 마리마와 나타난 그리스도의 편지니 이는 먹으러 쓴 것이 아니오 오직 살아계신 하나님의 영으로 한 것이여 또 돌비에 쓴 것이 아니오 오직 육의 신비에 한 것이라. 우리가 그리스도로 말미암아 하나님을 향하여 이 같은 확신이 있으니 우리가 무슨 일이든지 우리에게서 난것 같이 생각하여 스스로 만족할 것이 아니니 우리의 만족은 오직 하나님께로서 났으니라. 저가 또 우리로 새 언약이 일꾼 되기에 만족해 하셨으니 이문으로 하지 아니하고 오직 영으로 함이니 이문은 죽이는 것이요 영은 살리는 것이니라. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory.
When my sister and I were teenagers, we had a number of pen pals from overseas. Between us, we had pen pals from South Korea, Scotland, Spain, Germany and India. And in those days, the mail from overseas was quite slow. Not unlike today, really. And there was always much excitement when one of us received a letter from one of these far off and exotic places. We would pore over those letters and for us, they opened a window to other worlds. Through those letters, we caught a glimpse of life lived in different ways, so very different from the life that we lived in a small town in rural Australia. The letters spoke of places that we'd never seen, food that we'd never heard of, and places that, and customs that were intriguingly different. We realised that not everybody lived the same way that we did, and it gave us a desire to visit these places so that we could see them with our own eyes. Later, when I was at university, I used to haunt the mailbox towards the end of every week, expectantly waiting for the weekly letter from home from my mother. And that letter was always full of news about my sisters and stories of what friends and neighbours were up to. And they always contained news of how her beloved garden was faring. In the warmer months, it was stories of what was growing. In autumn, it was always bemoaning the sheer volume of leaves that could come off a 50-year-old liquid amber. And in winter, it was counting down the days until spring when she could get out into the garden again. And while I loved to hear news from home, and my mother had a way of writing about the mundane that always made me laugh, but for me, these letters were a weekly reminder that I was part of a family and a community. More than that though, they were a weekly reminder that I was loved. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he tells them that they are a letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. In a time when letters of introduction and recommendation were required, Paul tells the Corinthians that they are Christ's living reference. Their words, their actions, their very lives were to be Christ's letter of introduction and recommendation to a world who did not know him. The message version of the Bible puts it this way. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read just by looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit, not chiseled into stone, but carved into human hearts. When I think of what a physical letter from Christ might look like, in my mind's eye, I picture something beautiful and intricate like the illuminated manuscripts, like the Book of Kells. But Paul tells us that actually, a letter from Christ looks like us. We, the church, are Christ's letter to people in our time. With the living word in our hearts, written by and with the spirit of the living God, we are Christ's living reference. What does our letter tell of the goodness and grace of God? Does our letter offer a broken and tired world a glimpse of glorious and exotic places that inspires them to want to visit? Does our letter tell of the good news? Mother Teresa said, I am a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. Do we, as a letter from Christ, tell the world it is loved by God with a deep and abiding love? We may actually be the only letter that some people will receive, the only letter from Christ that will reach them. Our world sorely needs to read the letter from Christ that we embody, the letter of love, hope and reconciliation that the spirit of the living God has written on our hearts. Let us pray. O oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus the Christ. Fill all creation with that word again through us, your church, that we may be Christ's letter to the world, proclaiming your joyful promises to all nations and sharing news of hope for all peoples. May we become one living body, your incarnate presence on the earth. Amen.
reading from the letter to the Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. A reading from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. One of the joys of ministry is helping couples as they prepare for their life together and to mark that commitment in the rituals of marriage. It's always been my practice to have a rehearsal before the wedding day and I've come to see that as a kind of safety valve where a couple can make mistakes, express their nervousness and let off steam before the big day. There's a lot at stake in taking this move into marriage. It's a big commitment, and there are often high expectations and hopes of a life of mutual loving care and happiness. In the Gospel of John, the very first sign Jesus gives is at the celebration of a wedding where he changes water into wine, and not just any wine, but the very best Grange Hermitage. One of Jesus' favourite images of the kingdom of God is also of a wedding where people are gathered in joy to celebrate the union of a couple in marriage. All this goes to show how important this image is to Jesus. 
Joy, celebration, laughter over a wonderful wedding banquet surround a couple who pledge steadfast love and faithfulness through thick and thin. It was just such a commitment of constancy and fidelity that we find in the story of Ruth, whose pledge to her mother-in-law restores Naomi's hope and rekindles her life. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. Your family will be my family, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be, married, be buried. Ruth's long, lifelong pledge of steadfast love most likely inspired the vows that we hear a couple say today in a wedding service. We hear in those vows their commitment to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. It's no wonder that the image of the church as a bride and Jesus as the bridegroom had such currency with Jesus. Prophets like Hosea tell of God's faithfulness to the vows made to Israel while time and again Israel betrays that trust. And it is that shattered trust, that fractured bond, that Jesus came to heal. His purpose was to restore a broken relationship, to marry heaven and earth, and so draw us into the unity and love of God. To speak of the church as the bride of Christ is to speak of God's deep desire for a relationship of lasting love with us. A love, of course, that is reciprocated in our longing for God, in mutual love and faithfulness. Just as a bride and groom join hands in a marriage service and make solemn vows to each other, so God has drawn us into a new and binding relationship, a new covenant made possible by Jesus' freely offering of himself. God in Jesus has bound himself to us just as a bride and bridegroom are bound together in the covenant of marriage. When couples choose Paul's wonderful hymn of love in the first letter to the Corinthians for their reading, I often point out that in writing this, Paul is wanting to highlight the nature of God's love, a love that we grow into as we practice loving every day, a love that is patient and kind, never jealous or boastful, never arrogant or rude, a love that doesn't force itself on others, that doesn't keep a record of wrong, a love that trusts and so teaches us to trust, a love that never dies but remains steadfast and true. That's the love by which God holds us and the love that calls out an echoing love in us, mutual love between bridegroom and bride. So let's sing together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offering for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Our prayers today. Gracious God, we come to you this weekend aware of our identity as a group of Christians, people who are trying to live a Christ-like way. We have been reminded in our worship over the past two Sundays of powerful images that set us collectively apart from the rest of the world. But those images also shape how we relate to each other and to the wider world with respect and tolerance as we walk the pilgrim way. Help us to keep walking on the pilgrim way, O Lord. Today we bring to you our continuing concerns for public health and the toll the pandemic has on society all around the world. In Melbourne, we are loosening up from tomorrow, months of lockdown. In our prayers for all people today, we bring to you all those who have emerged from lockdown having lost loved ones, lost livelihoods, and perhaps lost a robust sense of their own identity. Comfort and retrieve us all, O oh God. Hold us in the palm of your hand more than ever. Here at St John's, we hold before you in our hearts those we know, both here and afar off, those we see and those we cannot see, in a moment of silence. Bring us nearer to you in our sufferings, as we are reminded of your son's suffering and how the crucifixion led to new life, reborn energy and a blossoming of new growth, much as we see in our gardens right now. We commend to you our minister, the Reverend Peter, and our lay leadership as we look ahead to life after lockdown. May we continue to appreciate their special gifts amongst us as we strive to embody Christ as a congregation. Grow us and shape us as a truly Christian church in these tricky times. We present all these petitions, consolidating them in the prayer that Christ taught us, which we can now say in a language in which we are fluent. 하늘에 계신 우리 아버지여, 이름이 거룩히 여김을 받으시오며, 나라의 임하옵시며, 뜻이 하늘에서 이룬 것 같이 땅에서도 이루어지이다. 오늘날 우리에게 일용할 양식을 주옵시고, 우리가 우리에게 죄 지은 자를 사여 준것 같이 우리 죄를 사여 주옵시고, 우리를 시험에 들게 하지 마옵시고, 다만 악에서 구하옵소서. 나라와 권세와 영광이 아버지께 영원히 싸움나이다. 아멘. Last Sunday I mentioned Rudyard Kipling's verse, O oh, east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, and mistakenly came to the conclusion that this was his last word on the matter. And since then I've been enlightened by a good friend, for Kipling went on to write, but there is neither east nor west, border, breed, nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. So, apology to Kipling, and I hope that you enjoy this service.
And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.